Ooh, fun stuff. These cores, is it just me or am I? It's just me.
welcome you to this gathering of Holiday Bible Church. Um, we're excited that you're here. We are excited to worship the Lord together. And we want to also give you a couple of announcements. Uh, and these are really just ways that you can either help serve the Lord uh, or encourage one another together, right? So here's a couple of things that you can keep in mind. One, when we talk about serving the Lord together, there are some needs in some areas where we could use some additional hands. Uh, so if you have not yet picked up a uh, what we call Come, Connect, Grow, and Go sheet, uh, we sent out a uh, digital sign-up for that a couple of weeks ago. We'll probably send one out again this week, um, but would love to have a few more folks in some key areas there. Uh, also, speaking of fellowship with one another, next week is Mother's Day, so there will be no Discovering God Hour next week. Uh, that way you are free to spend time with family, um, specifically moms. Okay, I have to spell that out for you. And then lastly, the last Friday of May, uh, there's going to be a teen activity here. So we'll give you more details as that nears, um, but something that Trevor is putting together for the last Friday of May. Well, Psalm 145, we take a look at God's Word this morning. Psalm 145 says, the eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Let's bow and let's fix our minds, let's fix our hearts on this holy God who is worthy of our praise forever and ever. Father, our eyes look to you this morning. We look to you for the food that we need. And that is more than just our daily bread. That is the words of life, the food which only you can give. And so, Lord, we together look to you to meet our needs today. And we know that you will. We know that you will offer richly and freely all that we need. Because you are righteous. And you are kind in everything that you do. And I know we doubt that. Or sometimes the things that you allow into our lives do not feel kind. But the problem resides with us. We don't share the same perspective. We are not infinitely wise. And so, Lord, we must learn to trust. Lord, we also trust that you fulfill the desires of all who fear you. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will fill. You will satisfy. For Lord, you hear our cry and you save us. What more could we ask? What more could we desire? There is None that we have in heaven beside you. And there is nothing on earth that we desire more than you. So Lord, for all of these reasons, my mouth, our mouth, will speak the praise of Yahweh. And Lord, let all flesh bless your holy name forever and ever. Amen. If you would, please stand with us to sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. God is the spring from which every blessing in our life flows.
Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming. not only our fount of every blessing, but as this song says, he's the beginning and the end. He is the alpha and he is the omega. He was there before there was nothing. How great is our God. start that one. I goofed that one up. That was my bad, all right? Let me restart that one. You're just catching me off guard here. I don't want to do this one wrong. I like this one too much. All right, here we go. Three, four. The splendor of the King Darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice. 
wonderful singing. You may be seated. We read in Psalm 62, 10, it says, Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Let's pray as we turn to our time of repentance. Our God, we are reminded, as we've just sang, how great you are. And how we, how low our affections are toward you. We put our faith and trust and confidence in so many things other than you, and especially in this area of money and things. We pursue them. We love them. We cherish them. We even chase after them in ways that we oftentimes regret. Yet that's where our hearts should be pursuing and chasing and loving you in those ways above everything else. So we confess, we confess ways in which this week we have not cherished you as we ought and we've put all kinds of other things ahead of you. Our desire today truly is to love and worship and cherish you to proclaim your goodness, to proclaim your glory to one another. And so we confess, we seek your forgiveness, and ask for your grace to worship you as you deserve today. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> Our scripture of assurance comes from Psalm 62, 7. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Amen. And because he is that refuge for us, we have more than 10,000 reasons to bless his name. We sin many more times than 10,000 reasons, and every time we repent, he gives new grace to us. 10,000 reasons. the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy.
Scripture reading is Galatians 6, 11 through 18. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble. For I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit, brothers. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you would, please stand for these final two songs. All the way my Savior leads me. Not uh, part of the way. Not until you sin a certain amount of times. But all the way. All the way to glory. He who has begun a good work in you will finish it. triumph of his blood when 
and my spirit clothed in mortal. And wings each flight to rounds of day. Lifts my soul through endless ages. Jesus led me all the Since he leads us all the way, we have the ability to have a still soul. Still my soul be still. Do not fear. The winds of change may rage tomorrow. The world is constantly changing. And one of the greatest fears I see in people is the fear of change. And this song teaches the truth that there is no need for that. We can rest in Christ.
Our God, we rest in you and in you alone. At least that is the desire of our heart. Though we also confess that we often feel pressed on every side. And at times our hearts can wander from you and we find no rest apart from you. So God, as we open your word, we pray that you would show us again the rest that you have promised, the rest from vain pursuit, as was mentioned earlier, as well as the rest from empty effort. God, we pray for those who were not able to be with us this morning. Pray specifically for Diana, Peach, as we call her. Lord, I pray that you would give her rest. I pray that you would speak peace to her soul. I pray that you would heal her body. She would know that you are with her even as she recovers. God, we pray for your word as it is proclaimed around the globe this morning in honor and in celebration of the risen Christ. Lord, I pray for Keystone Bible Church this morning as they meet in Odessa they meet in Wesley Chapel. Lord, I pray for the men who are leading that service, that you would give the words that your people need to hear. I pray that you would bring life to those words. Lord, fix our attention now on your word. I ask that you would give us life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Well, once again, Exodus chapter 20. By now, if you set your Bible down on its spine, it probably just automatically opens to Exodus chapter 20. We're wearing a path. Exodus chapter 20, in verse number 15, again, a, a relatively quick one. In Hebrew, it's essentially two words, like last week. In English, it is this. You shall not steal. Easy enough, right? In recent years, let's be honest, I say recent years, but the reality is uh, time is slipping away, and it's probably been longer than I realized, but uh, for some time now, there's been a growing trend, um, really around the world, but particularly in America, and that growing trend is that we make our purchases online, right? Are you with me? We all regret not having bought stock in Amazon years ago. But with the rise of ordering items online, that means there's also a rise in the need for delivery service. So there's a constant parade of trucks by my house through the week, dropping off various items, and generally leaving them on the porch. But as with anything in life, with something new, something convenient, there comes along someone, or in this case, many people, who would seek to take advantage of new opportunity. And so with the rise of online purchasing and delivery service has also been the rise of porch pirates. You heard of this, by the way? If you haven't, welcome, welcome to the 21st century, right? This is the reality of where we are. Porch pirates, what do they do? Like they, they, they wait or they follow a delivery truck, and, and when the delivery man drops a package at a door and they give a sufficient amount of time for that guy to drive on and to make sure you're not coming to the door immediately, they'll run up, they'll snag the package, 
get back in their car, and they're gone. Hopefully, right? It was estimated last year that over 260 million packages were stolen by porch pirates in the United States. But there is a man. You may have heard of him, but if you don't have teenagers, you probably haven't. This man's name is Mark Rober. Mark Rober is an engineer. Um, he worked for NASA for a number of years. As a matter of fact, the, the Mars rover, like he was uh, one of the developers on that, that fancy piece of machinery. He left all of that to go create a YouTube channel, because why not? Uh, and, and so he does like these cool engineering things and teaches kids engineering on YouTube. And it's a lot of fun. Well, a number of years ago, he decided that he had enough of the porch pirate thing. And so he created a box that looked like it contained some expensive cool piece of equipment like headphones or a gaming system. And, and inside the box, though, was this really sophisticated piece of machinery. So when you take the box lid off, uh, there's a, a massive amount of glitter that gets shot into the air and spun around and just sent everywhere. In addition to that, it contains fart spray that begins to squirt all over the people that stole the package in their living room. And if that's not enough, there's a device on there that prevents you from putting the lid back on the machine. And it also has cameras on all sides. He attaches phones to all sides of the machine, so the whole thing is captured on video, so you get to see um, justice being served, right? Not only is that, but because there are phones, it's GPS trackable, so he always knows where they are. He can go retrieve them and reuse them. Uh, these videos, by the way, I, I, count, I counted them up. They have been viewed over 300 million times since the first one debuted about four years ago. And I would guess that the reason for their popularity has less to do with watching people get glitter bombed and more to do with the pleasure we get out of watching thieves get what they deserve. There is something in us that goes, yeah, you know what? You deserve that. There's something that is both infuriating and unnerving about the fact that a person could have so little regard for another human that they would steal something right from your front door. Perhaps the most unnerving moment, if you watch these videos, I think the most unnerving moment of any of them is when you hear the voice of a child, probably not more than maybe 10 to 12 years old, the child is the one who stole the package, takes the package to his mother, and the mother's response was, well, they can always buy another one. That's unnerving. We have a sense of justice in listening to people gag over the smell of fart spray run outside with a package that they're afraid is going to explode. But let's be honest for a moment. As with the command to not murder, we're kind of left with a question of, of why is this, why is it kind of universally understood that stealing is wrong? Isn't it curious that no matter what culture you're in, no matter where you go, Theft is frowned upon. Where does that come from? What does it have to do with us? Well, let's go back to our three questions that we've asked of every one of these commands so far. Question number one. What kind of God would give this kind of command? Why would God say, don't Well, I'll give you the answer, and then we'll explore it a little bit. The answer is fairly simple. He is the kind of God who promises to provide for your need. And if he has promised to provide for your needs, and if we can trust him to follow through on that promise, then we ought to be able to rest in his provision rather than to feel the need to go and take 
what we want or take what we believe we need from someone else. God gives. God provides. He is a generous giver, by the way. We see this from the very beginning in Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. When God creates a garden for man, with everything that man would need. He's the kind of God that looked at Adam and said, you know what, there, there's something missing from this picture. Adam still has need, and so he creates from Adam woman to be the perfect match. God gave them every tree, every plant in the garden as food for them. He gave them purpose. He gave them work that was satisfying. He gave them fellowship. They had everything. Why? Because God is a generous giver. But that wasn't enough. Right? God put the one tree there and was like, you got everything, just not the fruit from this tree. This tree is a reminder that I am still your authority. And yet they took the fruit. And because they took the fruit, they deserved death. The day you eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. But you know what? They didn't die, did they? Why? Because God is a generous giver. And even for those who deserved death, instead, He gave them mercy. He gave them clothing to cover their shame. And he gave them a new place to live. God is generous. Psalm 145, we read this earlier. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. This is the kind of God that he is. He's not the kind of God who is stingy, who, who holds on to his stuff and refuses to share. It was the kind of God that opens his hand and gives freely, generously, to meet the needs of his creation. He distributes from his limitless supply of goods in order to meet the needs of the creation. That's the kind of God we serve. Philippians 4.19 make this a little bit more personal. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Well, listen, Christians, we know this verse, right? I don't think that verse came as a shock to any of us. But we have a problem with three words in that verse. We have a problem with the word every. My God will supply every. Some of your needs. Maybe you're tempted to believe that my God will supply the really big things. Like I can go to Him in the emergency situation. I'll trust Him with those because those are out of my control anyway. Or maybe you're the kind of person that's like, I don't know if God can control the big things. Like, like I get it, and He's, you know, the small things have been consistent. Like, you know, I got a paycheck and food in the cabinet. But man, when the big things come, or I fear the big things coming because I don't know whether I can trust Him. Folks, the verse says, my God will supply every need. The second word we have a problem with is the word need, by the way. Right, because I think we just, like we don't define need always correctly. Sometimes we have a hard time differentiating between need and desire. Or need and want. And sometimes our desires and, and our wants can be elevated to the point that they feel like need. Like, I, I'm not going to make it without this. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Well, listen, I understand there's overlap sometimes between want and need. I get that. That is very true. And sometimes our, let's also understand this as well. Because sometimes I feel like our wants, our desires get a bad rap here. 
Like, like we should always just be putting off our desires and putting off our wants. We're going to see by the end of the sermon, Lord willing, if we get there. Um, that's not how God operates with us. Our wants can be legitimate, and they can be good, but it does not make them new. My God will supply all of your needs. And the last word we have a problem with is your needs. My God will supply every need of your needs. We have a problem with that word, don't we? Because it's one thing to think, yeah, okay, God is going to supply every need of, you know, like the great Christian leaders like Paul. Or yeah, God's going to supply every need of the great you know, men of faith, the great prayers like George Mueller. You ever heard of George Mueller? The guy that had the orphanage and, you know, there would be nights where there were no food and he'd have all the kids come and sit around the table and he'd be like, we're going to pray for dinner tonight. And they would sit around with nothing and they would pray and a knock would come on the door and there are all the groceries sufficient for him to feed all of the orphans in his orphanage that night. And his biography, by the way, is full of, of those kinds of occurrences just over and over and over again. If you haven't read it, read it. But it's easy to sit back and go, oh yeah, like men like that, God hears their prayers, God answers their prayers, and God meets their needs. But it's something very different to truly believe that God makes those promises to you, Christian. It is for you. The promise of provision extends to you. And sometimes we have a problem differentiating wants and needs, and God will push us on that. And sometimes God will hold out in His deliverance and in His provision until what feels to us like the very last minute. Because we forget that God does not operate in a chronological time frame. God is free to do what He wants, when He wants, and He is always promises for you. This is the kind of God he is. He is a generous giver. James says this, and this will give us a second thought about who this God is. James 1.17 says, every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation nor shadow due to change. God is unchangeable. He is not like the shadows of this building that will move as the sun moves. There is no shadow of turning with him. There is no variation. So then we can bank on it that he is a generous giver all the time. That is his character. That is who he is. And he gives every good gift. Everything good we have in this life comes from him. Why? What does that mean? Well, it means it's an indicator. It's a reminder. That God owns it all to begin with. The reason he can give generously and open his hands to all because he owns all. It is his to give. It is a limitless supply. Psalm 24 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. Now we have missed this in our day, haven't we? We're so convinced that the world belongs to us that we should just be able to take it and manipulate it and do whatever we want with it. It is not ours. It is his. Hebrews 3, 4 says, For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. All things belong to the Creator. Which means our ownership our possess- possessions is really more like stewardship than ownership. Kind of like Adam and Eve in the garden, right? Like they were put in the garden, they were given authority over all things except the one tree, right? And what was their job? Their job was to steward the garden, keep it, guard it, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's language of stewardship. Take care of what I have given to you because ultimately it's not yours, it's mine. Our ownership 
is more like stewardship. This is much like the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. Remember that where Jesus give, or Jesus is talking about the, this rich man who goes away and he gives money to each uh, of three servants before he goes. And one gets five and one gets two and one gets one, right? And the one who only got one, Jesus comes back and is like, what did you do with it? And he's like, oh, I buried it in the ground because I was afraid. He, he kind of squandered it. He didn't do anything with it. And so the wealthy landowner takes back what he had given. By the way, what's interesting, just to, this is going to be a, a little thread woven through portions of the service until we get to the end. What, what's interesting is when Jesus talks about the, the, the parable, the, the use of the wealthy man's money by the servants was going to be for the good and the glory of the master, right? Like we, we know that it was his money. He was going to reap the benefits of what was done with that money, but it does not mean that there was not motivation of reward from the servants themselves because the better they managed that money, the more reward they would receive. So there's this dual motivation given to a believer that we are ultimately seeking the glory of God, but in seeking the glory of God by using and stewarding the gifts and the talents that He has given us, we are recipients of blessing. Then sometimes we, we have this, this perspective of God that he's, you know the difference between the stick and the carrot, right? When it comes to motivation. Like the stick is I'm going to beat you from behind to get you to go where you need to go. The carrot is I'm going to dangle a reward in front of you and you're going to pursue the reward. And sometimes we have this impression that God is always with a stick. just kind of beating us down the pathway to holiness. And we miss the fact that over and over and over again, God is dangling this big, fat, juicy carrot. If you don't like carrots, substitute it for like, I don't know, honey buns, whatever is your thing, okay? The point is, like those servants, we are stewards. We are managers. That's what a steward is. You are managers of what is ultimately God's property. Now, these two truths about God lead us to a couple of fundamental realities that we need to get a hold of, okay? Number one, all theft, then, is not just against the person being robbed, but it is a sin against God himself. He is the owner and distributor of all good things. Theft, then, is a violation of his good will towards you and to your neighbor. It's essentially saying, I don't like my allotment. I think I deserve more. And I think he has too much. So I'm going to take from what he has in order to kind of pad my own coffers. It's also an attack against a fellow image bearer. We're harming them not only by taking what is theirs, but by destabilizing them either financially, right? Because they need what we're taking or emotionally. Because Having something stolen from you, that's unnerving. It's destabilizing. That's uncomfortable. The second fundamental reality, one is all theft is sin against God. Two is this. This command that you shall not steal lays out the fundamental right to own personal property. This is where the rights of personal property begin. Because God is both owner and giver of all good things, and no one has the right to take what he has given to someone else. It's yours to steward. Those three servants couldn't go like fight each other and steal each other's talents. Why? Because it was theirs. They had the right to possess it. They had the right to steward, to manage it. This command establishes personal property rights. If you own it, then this commandment says it is yours to enjoy or to share or to give away. It's yours. And the reality is this, folks. The notion of private property is essential to the fabric of any society. Because when thievery is rampant, it's evidence that society is breaking down. There's no respect for private property which means there is no respect for individuals themselves. 
It's, it's a type of community where individuals see themselves as greater than their community. And where victims are left feeling insecure and vulnerable, even in their own home. So yet again, here in commandment number eight, just as we've seen with all of these commandments, particularly in the second tablet, is that God is interested in human flourishing. These laws are there not just because God is holy, but also because God is interested in what is good for mankind. And what is good for our communities is that we understand and recognize and honor the right to private property. This law is about having a kind of community that is secure, content, and generous. It's about respecting our neighbors and their possessions. Folks, that is the kind of community that will thrive. But when those essentials begin to break down, the community will suffer. That's the kind of God that would say to us, don't steal. Which leads us to our second question. What kind of people need to hear this command in the first place? Well, here's the fundamental reality about us. The reality about us is that we are discontent. We're discontent. We are not satisfied with God's provision. We want more. We feel as if we deserve more. So much so that we can just take what hasn't been given to us and make it ours. We're not content. And so we are poor stewards. And so we disrespect not only the God who commands that we do not steal, but we disrespect the one made in his image. Now, by the way, when we talk about thievery, when we talk about, we're, we're just going to run through a list of what does that mean? And where does this apply? And I think we understand that, that just breaking into someone's house and, and filling a bag with items and grabbing the TV and running out the door, I think we're pretty good with saying that's wrong, right? I think we're even good with saying running up to someone's porch and grabbing a package and running away, that's wrong. I think we're all in universal agreement that driving down the street and pulling over and smashing out the window of a car and grabbing someone's backpack and going, I, I think we're all in agreement that's wrong. I think we would also be in agreement in, with Exodus chapter 21, verse 16, that says, whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. Right? In, in other words, the, the problem of theft extends to human rights as well. By the way, this one verse, Exodus 21, 16, would have put an end to the kind of slavery that scarred this country's history. I know there are questions about, you know, Bible talks about slavery and, and how to do slavery. We'll, we'll talk about that because we'll come to that in Exodus uh, uh, later. Right? But for now, understand that the kind of slavery that was promoted in this country for decades would have been eliminated by this one verse. You cannot steal a man and sell him. Thievery. It's a violation of the commandment. And in fact, it is one of the grossest violations of the commandment. It is worthy of death for both the seller and the buyer. But what about us? Okay, this is the question we always come to. Well, what about us? Because I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it's probably been a minute since most of you went into a convenience store even and stuck your pockets full of, you know, candy and slipped out the door, right? Probably been a minute. Now, I, I would probably be a little naive to say it hasn't happened. As a matter of fact, I, I know just last week, um, someone's bicycle was stolen right out, from the, right, right out in front of the front door. It was there, we went in to eat, we took out the trash, and it was there, went back in, came out, it was gone, right? So I'm watching this, if you roll up in a bicycle, not yours. Scratch your nose. 
What does this have to do with us? What helps us answer that question? I want us to go back. We've, we've used the catechisms a lot over the last couple of weeks. In part because the catechisms put a lot of thought into these commandments. And because of that, they're very helpful. They're very biblical. And so I want us to go back to the Heidelberg Catechism again, and I want us to listen to question number 110. What does God forbid in the Eighth Commandment? When God says, thou shalt not steal, what is, what is he forbidding? Here's the answer. He forbids not only the outright theft and robbery punishable by law, but in God's sight, theft also includes cheating and swindling our neighbor by schemes made to appear legitimate, such as inaccurate measurements of weight, size, or volume, fraudulent merchandising, counterfeit money, excessive interest, or any other means forbidden by God. In addition, he forbids all greed and pointless squandering of his gift. Now, let's just, that's a mouthful. Let's consider some of these things. He says that what, God's, what God means by saying thou shalt not steal, part of it is he's talking about cheating and swindling other people, students. Teens, kids, listen to me for just a second. Cheating on a test or on a homework assignment is a type of theft. It is a violation of the Eighth Commandment. You are taking an answer that is not yours. Either you just didn't study it hard enough to make it yours, or maybe you did study it hard enough and, and in the moment you forget it, but it doesn't give you the right to take from someone else or somewhere else. It's theft. Cheating is a form of stealing. Plagiarism. You are stealing what someone else wrote and claiming it to be your own. How about cheating the government? I mean, Jesus says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar. And by the way, he didn't give us a percentage of what Caesar should expect. I mean, the expectation of that statement is if Caesar demands it, I'm to give it. Paul follows this up in Romans 13, verse 6, and says, For because of this, you also pay taxes. You pay your taxes. That's a command. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing, to pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed. Folks, listen to me. Misrepresenting your income is theft. It is a violation of the Eighth Commandment. How about cheating a worker out of the pay that he is owed? Deuteronomy 24.14 says, You shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land within your town. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and counts on it lest he cry against you to Yahweh and you be guilty of sin. Pay what is owed, particularly when someone is living hand to mouth. I, I think a modern day equivalent to this might be if there's someone who's from another country and maybe they're used to working for $6 an hour, and you take advantage of that fact. I'm not sure that that's not a violation. But you're not guilty of breaking the Eighth Commandment. James chapter 5, verse 4 says, Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your field, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. God How about on the flip side of this employer-employee relationship? How about cheating an employer out of a good day's work? You know, you come in and, you know, I mean, I think everyone, particularly if you're working at a desk, like every employer knows that you're going to probably check your email every now and again. You're going to talk to coworkers. Like, that's understandable. But when that turns into hours, we're taking advantage. 
Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. Paul says, and to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, right? Mind your own business. And to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. In other words, Paul is saying that we should work in such a way that two things become true about us. Number one, we have a good reputation with outsiders. In other words, outside of the church family. We are to work in such a way that it reflects God's own excellence in our work habits. Number two, we should work so that we don't have to be dependent on someone else. In other words, if you are able to work, then you should desire to work long enough and hard enough so that you do not have to be dependent on other people. Now listen, a person who's in need because of physical ailment or age, that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about able-bodied individuals. A person who is in need because of their own laziness is guilty of thievery. You are stealing from the efforts of other people's labor. when you are perfectly capable of working yourself. 2 Thessalonians 3.10. If a man will not work, what? Neither shall you eat. This could also include outright theft of your employer, by the way. Taking merchandise, stealing office supplies, skimming a little money out of the register. Cheating employers. Mentions inaccurate measurement right there in the catechism. This is not something that registers with us. Um, it's not a common experience for us to pay things based on a scale of what they weigh. But even up until, I mean, not all that long ago, it was not all that uncommon to go to a butcher shop and the butcher puts a slab of meat on the scale. And, and you know, we, we still have this, right? You go in. In the grocery store, and you have them shave the fancy meats, right? Not just like the Oscar Mayer prepackaged stuff. I'm talking like the fancy stuff, and they shave it for you, and they drop it on the scale, and you pay based on what it, what, what, what the weight is. Well, that used to be the way the marketplace worked. And so, in Malachi, or I'm sorry, in Amos chapter eight, God says, "Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over, and, and that we may sell grain?" And the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances. God is like, I see what you're doing. You're giving inaccurate measurements. You're making the ephah, which was a measurement particularly of grain, you're making it small. In other words, you're not giving people everything that they paid for. I don't know, I, I heard, I, it's been a while since I've seen this picture, but I read in a couple different places over the week. Uh, there's an old Norman Rockwell painting of a woman who's at a butcher shop, and she has what looks like a, I don't know, maybe a chicken or something, and it's on the scale, and you've got the butcher behind the counter, and the lady all dressed in her Sunday finest on the front side of the counter, and the butcher has his thumb on the side of the scale with the chicken, and the woman has her thumb on the side of the scale with the weights. Why? Because he was trying to make the chicken look a little bit heavier than it actually was. She was trying to make it look a little bit lighter than it actually was, and God says that kind of activity is a violation of the Eighth Commandment. Inaccurate measurement. God's promise, by the way, in Amos, it comes in verse number seven, is that he will never forget the deed of someone who cheats with inaccurate measurement. And let me throw this in there also. If you're reading through Amos, and, and quite frankly, in a lot of other places, you know, about the workers, God is like, there's particular attention given to the poor and needy. Do not do this to the poor and needy. You're cheating the poor and needy when you use imbalanced scales. Part of the reason is because the people most affected by this kind of cheating are the poor. They're the ones who, who it's harder on them when the dollar's not going as far as it should because they're being cheated and swindled. God has a particular interest in caring for those who are destitute, those who are in need. So when you cheat and swindle, God takes great interest. Right? You're doing great harm to the most vulnerable 
in our community, which ought to lead us to give special interest to the most vulnerable in our community. And yet, even in our community, they're often the ones most frequently cheated on, most frequently taken advantage of. God doesn't forget. On the flip side of that, let me say this really quickly, too. This does not mean it's okay to cheat and swindle people who are not destitute, right? We, we kind of have this Robin Hood complex in our society. As long as you're robbing from the rich to give to the poor, it's okay, right? Well, that, that exception is not there either, right? The rich should be generous like God is generous. But nowhere do we have the right to cheat and steal even from the rich, to give to the poor. Um, he goes on. And we're, we're, there's just, there are so many fraudulent merchandising. I mean, can you think about this in our society? Where, where marketing is like, I, it, it's one of the biggest industries on the planet right now. Everything is being marketed. Fraudulent merchandising. You ever fallen victim to that? But like, all kinds of promises about what this thing's going to do. The magic pill, right? Take this pill for 30 days and you're going to lose 100 pounds and look like a model. That's a cheat in two ways, by the way. It's a cheat because it's selling you a false hope. And it's also a cheat because it's tearing down your own worth and value in your own mind. I can't help but think of this in terms also of social media where people are selling themselves, like their personalities or their looks, like, look at me, look at this video, look what I do. The more you watch, the more marketable that person becomes, the more money that they can make. But listen, okay, particularly, again, teenagers, those of you who are in this kind of thing, can, can we just be honest with the fact for a minute that the vast majority of what they're putting out there is fraudulent? Do you know that there are companies where you could go right now and you could, you could pay a little bit of money to, to a studio and they will make your pictures look like whatever you want. They, they, will, they will give you the use of a green screen and make it look like you're in Tahiti on a beach somewhere. They will give you use of designer clothing to make you look more wealthy than you are. It's all fraudulent. Just know that going in. It ain't real. Brief soapbox excursion, okay? That's, that's marketing, fraudulent marketing, excessive interest. Man, we could go down this rabbit trail too. Right, let me just say this. I don't feel like the Bible says interest in itself is wrong. Exodus chapter 22 says if you charge interest, you should not charge interest to destitute people. You should give and help them get back on their feet. But look, again, in the talents, the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, Jesus says that the, the, the wealthy man comes back to the guy with one. He's like, you should at least put it in the bank and it would have earned some interest, right? What the Bible seems to be interested in is excessive interest or interest that is added to someone who is destitute already. Interesting historical fact here. John Calvin seems to be the first person in, in kind of the medieval church age to argue that some, um, some uh, rates, some interest is accessible. That's, that's permissible according to the scripture. And so what he said, if you're poor and needy, you should not be charged interest at all. But if you are wealthy and you're just kind of starting a business, then it's okay to charge that individual a little bit of interest. But you know what? It, this was such a serious matter in Geneva where John Calvin lived. They saw this as a theological, spiritual issue. So guess who was in charge of setting the interest rate? Pastor John Calvin. The government was like, we don't want involved in that. This is a theological, spiritual issue. We're giving it to the church. Excessive interest. And man, listen, we could go on and on and on. The catechism ends with, and any other means forbidden by God. So we could add things like stealing. I mentioned this already briefly. Stealing from your employer. We could add robbing from God himself. Malachi 3.6. Will a man rob God? Like who's going to do that? Who's foolish enough to rob God? And yet here was God's response, yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. Now listen, folks, let me be very clear. I, 
I don't believe the Old Testament idea of a tithe. The tithe is one-tenth. I don't believe that Old Testament expectation, command, requirement carries over to the New Testament. However, I would say two things about this. Number one, I think the Old Testament tithe worked out to be far more than 10%. And by the time you add up everything they were giving, it was probably more like 20 to 30%. I don't think that carries over. However, The New Testament does make it clear that those who have been blessed by God will give cheerfully in support of the ministry of God. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This verse, by the way, is a reason why we went away from passing plates like it's kind of typical in churches. Because we read that one day and went, not under compulsion. And there's something about having a plate put in front of you where you go, oh, I wasn't going to give, but all right, here we go. Compulsion. I want to remove that temptation from you. So I had a guy build a box and put a hole in the top. Right? It's there. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. Because God's people give willingly. And so we don't even hardly ever mention it. People will come here for a week and like, how do you give in this place? I'm like, well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> There's a box or you can do it right on the top. We trust that if this is God's church, full of God's people, then God's people will support the work of God's ministry. Again, we can go on and on. Mentions greed. Greed is not good. Okay, we'll just leave it at that. We said this in our fear and anxiety study. Greed goes beyond need. It is concerned only with accumulation and teaches us to fear want and generosity. That's what greed does. You want to know whether it's greed in your heart or not? Ask yourself what you're afraid of. Are you afraid to be generous? Are you afraid to have a little less? Greed goes beyond need and only looks to accumulate. And then the, uh, the catechism ends with this, the pointless squandering of his gifts. Again, think of the parable of the talent. The servant who was given one talent did nothing with it. He squandered it. He was a poor steward of it. Which brings us to our third question. What should we do then in light of the Eighth Commandment? Because by now, if you've been with us through this study long enough, you know that we can't just walk away with the the idea or with the understanding that, well, I can't take stuff that's not mine. There goes my Sunday afternoon. Right? You know it's going to go beyond that, right? You know, you, you know there's that's there, there's more to it. Okay, so let's let's go back to the catechism again. Question one eleven. What does God require of you in this command? Here's the answer. That I do whatever I can for my neighbor's good that I treat others as I would like them, to be treat, like them to treat me, and that I work faithfully so that I may share with those in need. In other words, the Eighth Commandment lays the foundation not just for stable society where we're not always just taking what doesn't belong to us, but the kind of society that is able and capable to turn and act in generosity towards one another. It's the kind of community that the New Testament says each man should look to the needs of his brother. It's the kind of community that plays out in the church in Acts chapter 2 where it says that everyone sold what they had and gave to each other as there was need. Which again was not communism. Communism says you do not have the right to personal possession. But you remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? They come in and like, hey, we sold our property and we're giving all the proceeds to God. And Peter's like, you lied and now you're dead. Right? What was the problem? The problem was not that they kept back some of the money. It was their personal property. They had the right to do that. The problem was they lied about it. If they would have come to Peter and said, we sold property and we're going to give a tenth, we're going to give 20%, whatever it is, we're going to give half. I I think Peter would have been like, man, that is fantastic. Praise the Lord. But they didn't. We sold the property and we're giving everything. You have the right to personal private property. But, Here are three things I want us to to hit in the final five minutes. Number one, what do we do? Practice good stewardship. God owns you and me. Nothing that we have is ours. Everything we have belongs to him. Philip Ryken in his commentary on this passage says, what the Bible means by ownership is not possessing things to use for our own purposes, but receiving things from God to use for his glory. 
we've received from him, we use it for him. Which means, very practically, very practical terms, take care of what you've been given. Man, kids, teens, man, take care of what you have. Don't be wasteful by letting it fall into disrepair. Take care of what belongs not only to you, but to other people. Don't, don't just assume that, well, it's not mine, so I guess I can scrap it. But you know, I will never forget when I was a teenager, we were getting ready to take a trip. And, and I, my youth pastor challenged us. He's like, everywhere we go, every restaurant we stop at, when we go in, we're going to leave the restaurants in better condition than we found. He's like, we will, have, we will have a couple of you go into the bathrooms and wipe down the countertops, make sure there's not water everywhere, soap spilled everywhere. We will get a, 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 a towel from management. If they will allow us, we will wipe down our own tables. We will pick up our own trash. Now listen, I'm not saying that needs to be like the rule, but I will tell you to this day, when I go into a restaurant or even like here and I wash my hands and a little bit of water gets on the counter and I get the paper towel and I wipe it off. Not because I'm a great person, because I tend towards, you know, being legalistic. <laughs> so, like, well, he said, and so I'm going to keep doing it. Take care of what other people have been given from God. Number two, be generous. Be generous. We delved into a little bit of theology of work earlier from 1 Thessalonians 4. And I want to add to that this passage from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal, right? There it is. Obey the eighth commandment. Don't steal. Stop it. But it doesn't end there. But let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Folks, in other words, not only are we to work in such a way that we earn a good reputation, and not only are we to work so that we do not have to depend on anyone, but we are supposed to work so that we have enough to give when someone else has a need. And man, that ability is going to vary widely from person to person, from family to family. But it ought to be a desire for us to be able to give to be generous. It's not enough to simply stop stealing. The expectation is that we will become generous givers, just like our God. Kent Hughes, an old uh, pastor, said this, every time I give, I declare that money does not control me. Perpetual generosity is a perpetual de-deification of money. What does that mean? That means every time I give, every time I am generous, I am taking money out of the position of God and I'm bringing it down. You are not my God. I will not serve you. That's what generosity does. It declares that I do not serve money. Which is really important since Jesus said you can't serve God and money. By the way, those two are mutually exclusive. You will either love the one and cling to the other, right? Or you're going to despise them, right? Those are the only two options. We've got a great example of this, by the way, in the story of Zacchaeus. I don't have time to go through it. Look it up. Luke chapter 19. Here's a man who was a thief and a robber. And when he meets Jesus, what does he say? I'm going to give half of everything I have to the poor. And if I have stolen from everyone, I'm going to give back four times what I stole. Listen, that did not earn Zacchaeus a place amongst Jesus' followers. It wasn't because he gave that he earned salvation, that he became a believer. No, he became a believer because Jesus met him and made him new. And because he was made new, he had the desire no longer to steal but to give. That's what Christians do. If you want further evidence of this, by the way, consider Jesus on the cross who was flanked by two thieves, right? The one thief says to Jesus, Remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus says, I'll see you in a minute. Right? Today, you're going to be with me in heaven. That man never had opportunity to give restitution to anyone. It's not the restitution. It is not the act of generosity that saves. It is the act of generosity that flows out of a heart that has been regenerated by the Savior. Third. 
Number one, be a good steward. Number two, be generous. Number three, hear Jesus. Hear him. And here's what I want you to hear. And, and this is why I want you to hear. And then I'll tell you what I want you to hear. Because his way of handling us is not to berate us for having desires. He does not berate us. He does not bludgeon us. He does not condemn us because we want security or safety or even possession. He doesn't. Instead, what he does is tap into our desires for those things. And then calls our attention to a better treasure. He doesn't say, stop wanting treasure. He says, start looking at a better treasure. Treasure that will last. Security that will never fail. Safety that will never go away. Store up treasure in heaven. Because that's what matters. And you will find yourself less worried about porch pirates and more content to steward what God has given you for His glory and the good of others. Let's pray. Lord, this command is not as simple as perhaps we thought. It is not as easy as just stop stealing. Because it touches on things that are near to our heart. Things like greed. Things like discontentment. Things like we have a difficult time trusting you to provide for our needs. We have a hard time trusting your definition of what is truly a need. And so God, we pray this morning not just that you will rescue us from thievery, but that you would change our hearts that you would take the work that you have already begun in us and that you would perfect that work. Release us from slavery to money, possessions. May we learn to use them as stewards instead of owners. May we seek to use them for the good of others rather than to establish our own identity. God, make us a generous people. I am thankful for the evidences of that generosity that already exists in this body. Lord, I hear stories routinely of people being generous with their time, people being generous with their money, people being generous with people being generous with their home. God, I'm thankful for the work that you have already done in the lives of your people. May our generosity spill out into gospel testimony in the communities that surround us. Communities that are broken, ravaged by greed and theft. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would please stand with us to sing the chorus of How Great Is Our God. How great. going to have about a 10 to 15 minute intermission and then adults you will meet back here and youth you will meet with me in the other building you are dismissed